Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Mastering the Art of the Sales Email, brought to you by the Canadian Professional Sales Association. Canadian viewers, please note that the sales email strategies and insight provided in this webinar should only be used when emailing those who have received expressed or implied consent. For additional information on Canada's anti-spam legislation, please go to fightspam.gc.ca. Please note that you will, you will be able to ask questions at the end of the session using the Q&A function. We'll try our best to answer all questions within our allotted time. Your webinar host today of Mastering the Art of the Sales Email is Heather R. Morgan, CEO of Salesfolk. Salesfolk has helped over 450 companies revitalize their sales prospecting strategies. Having written 10,000 plus sales emails in the past decade, Heather has developed a new process for crafting personal sales emails, combining both copywriting best practices and game theory. Her sales emails see at least three times more responses than the industry average. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Heather to start. Thanks, everyone. So, what I want to talk about today is how do you get customers? There's a lot of different strategies you can employ. You might rely on introductions and referrals, which are great when you have them, but you don't always have them. You might do cold calling or sit, uh, basically have sales calls, which can work, but isn't always as effective or scalable just since it takes more time. Or magic. No, uh, actually what we're going to be talking to about today is how to use sales effectively because sales emails effectively because uh, sales emails are almost magical. So there's about uh, five different rules I'm going to be going over in today's presentation. So the first rule is to know your audience. Because sending an email to a CEO is not the same as sending one to a CTO or a VP sales. And I've noticed a number of the emails that you sent me were to manufacturing or um, a lot of different technical industries. And so it really is crucial for you to think about who you're talking to because you wouldn't talk to the same to someone in manufacturing as you would in education. Of course, both options have people, and people have pain points and emotions that they care about, but you really have to be thinking about who these people are so that your message is relevant to their needs. So how do you do this? How do you have your message speak to people? You have to really understand your audience. And the way I like to do this is by what I call e-stalking. Obviously, if you have customers you can talk to, that's great too. But sometimes you're doing new research and investigation and you don't automatically know all that information. So a great way to find it is by poking around on LinkedIn and other parts of the internet. So how do you do this? How do you actually use this information? You usually would hop on LinkedIn first, um, assuming these people are on LinkedIn. If they're not, use whatever site they or their business is on. Um, there might be some kind of uh, industry-based website or forum or um, other site that would have information about these people that you could look at. But um, if I'm on LinkedIn, what I would do is parse the profile of one of the people I actually wanted to reach out to, and I would be thinking about and taking notes on what keywords will excite them, what tone they are using with their colleagues and their peers. Uh, a really great place to look for that is the recommendation section because some people might have a lot written in their LinkedIn profile in the body or in the um, under each like position company job they have, but not everyone will. So if they don't, a usually a really rich place to look for tone and getting a sense of just who these people are is actually in the recommendations section because you can see how they view other people that they work with or have worked with and also um, what's important to them, as well as how other people perceive them 
and what they really excel in or focus on in their career uh, in the recommendations that are given about them. So that's a really great place to look. Uh, if these people you're looking for are on Twitter, that can be a good place to try to understand um, what kind of content they like to share, uh, what influencers they trust, like who are they retweeting, who are they following, whose articles are they resharing and sharing. Uh, likewise, if they have any kind of writing that they've done, that can be a good place to look as well. Um, but overall, what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand what KPIs they care about and what pain points they have. And so the keywords or the, uh, the skills section on LinkedIn is also a really good place to look because you can um, see what they specialize in. And you might want to use some of those keywords from the skills section in your profile. So the more the better, and if you still don't really understand who these people are, what their, uh, what their role is, you can go and look at a job posting um, on whatever job posting site would be relevant to the industry and read the required skills and the expected duties for the role because that will also give you a better sense of who this person really is. So, <laughs> it's like I skipped part of my slide. I kind of already explained how to do this. So, I'll just move to the next one. So, my second rule is to be enticing because no matter what you're selling, no matter how sexy or unsexy it is, you need to think about how to appeal to your prospects. Um, because if you can't do that, if you can't be interesting and enticing, no one's going to read your message and you're not going to get a response. So, how do we do that? A big part of it is focusing on benefits instead of features. So, what's the difference between benefits and features? Well, features are basically um, a way of describing how something you do works, whether it is um, a product or a service. And so, if I was going to give an example of a feature, I might say our cars are fast. If I was going to turn that into a benefit, what I would do is think about how my customer would benefit from a fast car. And maybe it would be that they can drive twice as fast in this car. Uh, likewise, low prices on their own are not a benefit, they're just a feature. We're saying that you'll save $399 a year in auto insurance. It's, these aren't really necessarily email examples uh, since they're a little more B2C, but you get the idea with how the copy works. So if we were going to turn sales folks' features into benefits, we would say um, for our feature, we write sales emails. In order to turn that into a benefit, we would instead say something like, we help you start conversations with your future customers because um, that is a goal of our customers and also that's, that's positive, that's a benefit. Uh, the second feature, we optimize email campaigns, can be turned into benefit by saying something like, we can get you 3x more responses from qualified leads and I'm going to have a drink of water. So um, my third rule is show, don't tell. So the idea here is to let your customers' success brag for you. So instead of saying, like, we have the best whatever, it's a lot better and a lot more, excuse me, it's a lot uh, more powerful to have an anecdote or story about one of your customers' success rather than just talking about yourself because it makes you look less narcissistic and um, <clears throat> excuse me, it uh, will also be more credible and create social proof. So how do you build social proof and what is social proof? Social proof is basically um, things that you can mention about your customers. Simply name dropping your clients is some form of social proof. Um, 
but you don't have to do that. Obviously, sometimes you have NDAs with clients and you can't really say who they are, but you can describe them. So instead of saying something like, um, I worked with Box, you could say, I worked with a major uh, software storage company. Probably not quite like that, but you get the idea. Uh, you can describe it in one way or another. Um, and then as far as telling a story and actually having an anecdote and not just naming like four of your clients, it's really important to give specific details. And the reason for this is that it makes it more tangible and more believable. So it's really important that you make your examples and your story relatable uh, since people might not understand what you're talking about otherwise and you really want this to be something that when they read it they don't have to think they just understand and I'll give you a few examples in a minute of what this looks like but for example instead of saying reduced by 50% you can just say something like we cut blah 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 in half and um, the last thing you need to really think about with this is you need to make sure that your social proof seems credible so whether or not you're embellishing details or not um, isn't my business. What matters is your, your, does your audience believe you or not. So um, even if you say you increase whatever by 10x and it's true, if they don't believe you, it doesn't really matter. So for example, we often triple our clients' response rate for sales emails. Sometimes we 10x them. I usually choose to say triple because it sounds a lot more credible. And even though it's true that we sometimes 10x the results, that doesn't happen all the time. And that probably sounds too much for a lot of people. So it's better if I actually go with a lower number. And likewise, um, even if I wanted to use 10x, I might say 9x instead because 9x sounds like more of a real number than 10x. Uh, but we can look at this a little bit more. So here are a few examples of social proof. These would be in the middle of an email, after the intro, before the call to action. Um, and these are all from different emails, I think. Uh, yeah, they are. So the first one says, we cut client X's hiring in time in half from an average of 21 days to nine or less by allowing them to screen potential hires more conveniently with video interviews. Um, and so that one works really well because you said in half, but you're also giving specific days. So they can see really clearly in their head what this is, what this looks like. And then the second one says, before working with us, client X was wasting $690,800 a quarter on unnecessary printing cost. We were able to help them eliminate these costs while also backing up their file type documents in one central location. And so this one works really well because um, it's a very specific number. They could have said 700,000, but they said that. And the reason is that it sounds very real. It is real, but um, it just sounds more real than rounding up to 700,000. And um, it's just a very clear picture painted. And then finally, we have Client X had spent nine months trying to launch their new software app, and it was still too buggy to show customers. In less than two months, we helped them launch a working product that won blah, blah, blah award. So all these are very clear and specific. Um, you can have very different details and stories. You can have uh, pictures of, uh, not actual pictures, but uh, metaphorical pictures of a pain point they had before and how you solved it, kind of like the third one. Or you can have um, one where you just really focus on, on the benefit. But um, a lot of the best ones, uh, even actually all three of these, tend to show like where they were at before and how they improved and explain a little bit of uh, how that was able to happen without going too far into detail. And my fourth rule is to stay laser focused. And so in your emails, 
you want to just focus on one benefit at a time or one pain point because otherwise um, when you try to do too much it loses focus and you're less likely to get a result. So let me just show you an example of a laser focused email that we wrote for one of our customers that actually got a number of new customers or clients for them. And so um, as you can see, I actually like to write on top of the emails we write for our clients, the focus or the pain point or the benefit, just because it really helps when you're rereading the email and doing edits after that you can see the focus and remind yourself because if anything isn't related to that, then it probably needs to be cut out of the email or change. So the subject line is online competition for company job applicants and it says, hi first, I have an idea for an online competition that can help you quickly attract and spot the most qualified candidates from hundreds of applications. The same concept helps client X screen more than 290 job candidates and find their hire in only 10 days. When do you have 10 minutes to hear how this idea could work for a company? So see how short and sweet and simple this email is? That's why it's effective. Obviously, um, if you don't have the pain point of trying to hire people and having it take a long time, it won't work. But you know, you have to have product market fit and have the right audience to get um, a response. But this is one email in a sequence, and so. Uh, generally, when you're doing sales emails, you need to send more than one email. Um, and if, if you were in America and these emails were totally cold, I would say that you want to send eight emails um, because a third of them would get, uh, or sorry, the last half, the last five through eight, would get a third of your responses. But I realize in Canada that you can't do that. So um, it depends probably a little bit on uh, the source of your lead and how well they know you already. So you know if they um, if they requested more information from you on your website or call the number, then you can probably um, be a lot more forward and get a response a lot sooner than if you just gathered a list of people who attended a post-conference party that you co-hosted. Uh, where the latter, if it was a party list, and we see this a lot in the US, those people don't necessarily know anything about your product and they aren't necessarily qualified to buy. Um, you just got a nice list and that list might not actually be as interested as you think. And so you need to be considerate of that and realize that going into it. So think a lot about the source of your list and the context around it in terms of who these people are, what they're expecting from you, or what they already know or not, because that'll make a big difference too. Excuse me. Um, okay. Where was I? So rule number five is to evoke emotions. And so this is how you make your emails not boring. The solution is to replace boring buzzwords and jargon with enticing and interesting details. So first of all, before I get into these, I like to think a lot about um, what emotions you're trying to evoke. Are you trying to evoke fear? Obviously not like to terrorize them, but are you trying to make them a little bit afraid and uncomfortable thinking about one of their pain points? Um, maybe even a little bit upset, not at you, but at that problem? Are you trying to make them um, excited and think positive thoughts because um, of some benefit or value proposition you're offering? Or maybe you want to try to make them feel nostalgic referring to something that used to be, that's now changed, that will make you relate to them. There's a lot of things that you can do like that. Um, but it all comes down to, with any of these things, making sure that you understand your audience and who they are because it won't work if you use the wrong thing with the wrong people. So some people might be more cynical and skeptical. Um, and others might be more likely to be afraid of certain things. 
So you have to think about who your audience is and what's normal and what you expect from them. Um, but in general, with anyone, using rich adjectives that tease the senses, like smell, taste, touch, sound, and so forth, usually can work really well, even if you're selling something um, that is boring and uh, where you wouldn't normally use sensory words, it can really screws up your copy. So using words like delicious versus just taste good can make a difference. I realize that unless you're selling food, you're probably not going to be mentioning delicious in your sales emails, but there are plenty of metaphors and descriptors that you can use that aren't quite that obvious that still evoke the senses a lot more that would make your copy more enticing than, than just having it be flat. Um, likewise, as I mentioned, you really want to use, especially with social proof but not just, details and descriptions of things that people can actually picture in their heads like in less than five minutes versus saying 300 seconds or less. So the less you can say, the better, the more clear and tangible or easy to relate to it is, the better. And uh, likewise, uh, you need to think about creating metaphors that are easily relatable to. This, I would say, I'd be a little bit more cautious with since um, there's metaphors that not everyone might know, especially if um, there are cultural differences or maybe generational, like age differences between you and your audience. So be aware of that. Think about your audience and not just yourself. But um, you don't have to use the common metaphors even. You can create an analogy to help describe your product or service better. And that can sometimes go a long way to help them quickly understand something, to make it relatable and interesting and just memorable. So these are all good tactics. And then I would say, so my last tip on making your copy more emotional is after you're done writing, take a little break, take a little bit of a time to just get away from what you wrote so that your brain doesn't trick you and uh, have you miss little things in what you read. So take a walk, take a nap, whatever. Um, eat lunch, get a copy. Come back to your writing after that and read your writing out loud to yourself. This is important because you can actually listen to how it sounds and you'll catch a lot more errors that way. And as you do that, you need to ask yourself, if I was the reader, would I care? If I didn't know anything about my company, would this grab my attention? Or would I get bored and ignore this email? So this is something that you need to think about. And let's see, um, oops, wrong way. Uh, here are a few examples of some emotional and engaging copy. Uh, not all of this is from actual email copy. Some of it might be from websites and other things, but uh, just so you have a better idea. The first one says, our software provides bank raid security so you know your passwords are always secure and protected as Fort Knox. Um, but even with that, so Fort Knox is more of an American thing. I assume people in Canada probably know it, but I might use a different metaphor if I was trying to connect to Canadian companies. Um, and then the next one says, prevent customers from feeling let down and annoyed by making sure they never get ads that make them feel misled or disappointed. So rather than just saying like ads they dislike, we have misled or disappointed, which is a much stronger and more emotional picture. And then the next one says, our clients are enamored with us because they're seeing success higher engagement from ad campaigns that they thought were otherwise dead, which it's a simple but strong word. Um, and obviously software and ad campaigns can actually be dead, but um, that's a metaphor and, and we use it in everyday language, but it makes it much stronger. Uh, and then the next one says, instead of having boring and poorly segmented campaigns, create laser-targeted ad campaigns that are unforgettable. So I'm going to be doing the email critique, and 
tearing apart in a friendly way some emails now. But before I do that, I wanted to see if we had any questions with anything I've gone over so far. Maybe, Rufalin, you can um, help me moderate that. For sure, Heather. We've got one question here. Um, how many emails do you need to send typically to book an appointment with a decision maker? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so, like I said, if it was America and if it was cold, which I realize is not the case, um, I would say on average you would need to send eight. But if you've already um, had some contact with them, like uh, they're an inbound lead, meaning that they filled out a form on your, your website, um, it might be quite less. Uh, that would probably be like a good maximum that I'm extrapolating from. Um, but I don't think it would take that many because uh, if they've already expressed interest, they're probably going to be much more likely to respond in like the first three or four. Um, but there are a lot of different situations. So uh, if it's taking a lot of emails, you might want to ask yourself what is the quality of, of that lead or my lead source overall? Um, how interested are they or not? And um, also if you're not getting responses, and you think it is the right person or persons, you need to ask yourself um, uh, what are my messages saying or not saying uh, that we're not getting results. So um, I'd say it really depends uh, with more of like inbound leads. Uh, if you have a list that you've um, been given by like a partner, um, I'd say on the high end, um, maybe as much as eight, but um, I'm not I'm not an expert in um, all the Canadian spam law stuff, so I'm not sure as much about all the lead source is as far as where you're you're getting the contacts from. I know some of it's obviously inbound, but um, I, it would depend on the source of, of the lead. Uh, what's the next question? Awesome. Um, what are some of your ideas on changing up the subject line when you're emailing quite a few times? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. I'm not sure if it's asking if um, how do we actually change the subject line or should we change the subject line, but I'll answer both. So as far as uh, should we change the subject line between emails or send the same one with three, I would say that generally you want to have a different subject line every time. Um, there are some exceptions for this, depending on your, your open rate, response rate ratio. If you have a really high um, open rate on a, an email subject line, you might want to keep using that one, but you also have to ask yourself, if you have a high open rate but a low response rate, what might be wrong with that email and the body or the mismatch between the subject line and the body? Um, as far as how do you actually write a good subject line, um, I try to really base it on the email copy and my audience. And so I don't think about emails as far as like, uh, here's this tactic, use it, use it every time, because um, tactics die. Uh, just like a lot of people were using the whole who's the right person approach um, to find the right contact years ago, I think that approach is becoming less and less effective because more people use it and um, people get immune to it as that happens. Uh, but that said, um, as far as subject lines go, before we even write a campaign, what we do for our clients and what our writers do is uh, we'll actually research the audience and we'll make a list of different uh, pain points they have and benefits we think that they would be interested in or, or use cases for the product or service we're writing about. And so we're planning our email campaign before we even write anything, and usually um, that value prop or that pain point for whatever email we're focusing on will be something connected to the subject line. Um, it's not black and white, so um, you, you can think about subject lines like this. Um, they have one goal, to get them to open it. Uh, you do have to think about not just having them open it uh, because you do ultimately want them to read it and respond. So the subject line shouldn't be totally misleading, totally disconnected from your email, otherwise it will backfire. But um, a lot of times I will think about um, 
what these people are likely to open anyway. So, for example, if um, you're doing some kind of email where you're reaching out to um, to someone, actually, just a more generic example, any email that looks like it's about one of their customers or from a customer will get opened. You have to quickly bridge the gap so they don't feel like they're being misled. But if you write something that's ambiguous enough that could be sent by a customer, um, that will probably at least get open because they think that they might have to even just forward it on. Even if they're not on like um, a customer-facing role, even if it's more like marketing, if they see something they think is from a customer, they're probably going to open it and uh, read it just to forward it on. And then likewise, as far as um, vendors go, um, if it looks like you are you have an email from an existing vendor or business partner, more likely to get open. I'm not saying to, to fake it and say some other company's name, but think about what those emails they would be sending would be saying and what they would be putting in the subject line. That can help you a lot um, because you, you want to sort of I don't want to say blend in in a way that you just disappear in the noise, but you want to sound like either something that they would um, see and open regularly because their mind is trained to do that and they'll do it on autopilot, or um, you want a situation where uh, it's something really different that will stick out, but something that's relevant to them. So I've sent a lot of um, crazy subject lines over the years. I think I had one um, that said kimchi and octopus that worked really well that I sent around the American holiday Thanksgiving because um, my family doesn't really celebrate it the normal way and I don't really do a big thing of it but when it happens I like to eat kimchi and octopus. So um, we sent an email around the holiday and I had that be the subject line. I mentioned something like in the PS like P.S. What are you having for Thanksgiving? I'm having my favorite thing, kimchi and octopus. And so I think that was going out to like marketers or something like that and it was sort of a funny thing but I thought they would be intrigued and find it amusing and it would make me human. So it worked well but other times you want to just focus on a benefit. Um, having some kind of number related to your social proof in there can be good but it's not black and white. Um, you need to make it short uh, because it will be cut off on mobile phones if it's not uh, within the character limit. So I generally would say less is more. Um, that was a long answer, but uh, what's the next question? Uh, Rupalin? That how do you best? <laughs> intermix emails versus phone calls and or voicemail? Um, yeah, so I'm really not um, a calling, sales calling expert. Um, it depends on our customers. They do different things. Some of them don't do any calling. Some of them do a lot of calling. Um, it kind of depends on your audience. Uh, are they people that are likely to pick up the phone um, or not? So uh, it depends. Uh, but at the same time, I generally tell our customers to send at least a couple emails before they call um, just to try and see if they can get through to them without interrupting their day because I think more and more um, people don't uh, respond well to calls interrupting their day and they're less and less likely to pick up a call from a stranger because they're screening their calls. So um, it depends, but I mean, you could try different things and figure out what works, but uh, I'm really not an expert at the call part, so I don't have the perfect answer there. Awesome. Do we have time for one more, Heather? It's a really good question. So are there any specific techniques that you would apply to LinkedIn emails versus emails? Um, ultimately, they're really not that different other than the fact that LinkedIn is more expensive and a little bit less scalable. Um, sometimes it can be nice because uh, they can see who you are and, you know, if they have a really full inbox, it might cut through. But um, a lot of times I think, like for example with me, I check my Gmail inbox uh, daily, multiple times a day. 
I don't check my LinkedIn inbox every day because I get a lot of junk in there. And so um, I'm actually more likely to see and respond to an email than my LinkedIn inbox. Um, but uh, it depends on your audience and you can test it. The problem with LinkedIn is it's a little bit less uh, scalable since you couldn't do like a mail merge or something like that. Um, or use some of the other tools that can make emailing more people a lot easier. Um, but that said, the email itself isn't going to be that different from LinkedIn. Um, I would probably, so if they just added you on LinkedIn and you're sending it after they added you, you could say something like, hey, thanks for connecting on LinkedIn or something like that. Um, you might want to tailor it more to their profile. If you found them from a particular LinkedIn group you're in, you can mention that. But um, ultimately, your message should be focused on, on them and a benefit to them. So it's not really that different. Um, does that make sense? Perfect, Heather. Thank you. Um, do you want to take one more here? Yeah. What about the yeah. use of humor in emails? Wait, uh, can you repeat that? What about the use of humor in email? Do you oh, use humor. that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I like to use humor. Um, obviously, can depend a little bit on your audience because um, I actually have a really good friend who's a professional stand-up comedian. And um, although humor is universal in that um, we all have things that make us laugh, uh, there are a lot of things that make it differ and or make make us uh, interpret humor differently and think certain things are funny versus not. So I think what's important with humor is to really think about your audience and who um, you're talking to because uh, what you think is funny might not be funny to them or appropriate. Um, I think if you you use humor and you can use it well and um, see results with it, it's great. Um, I think it can make your, your emails much more interesting and lively. Um, but you have to be careful. Humor is not just reusing some meme that you saw another salesperson use in their email in a canned template. Humor is, when it's done correctly, it's intersecting between the audience and, and you and your product or service or business. And some other thing, adding some other thing to have probably an element to surprise and, and something interesting and unique. Um, but that said, I think it's great when people can pull it off, but I think if you're not very good at using humor, um, you should be careful about using it, uh, especially because certain industries, um, that might not really be appropriate. So like if you're emailing millennials and you send some like silly meme thing that everyone knows and, and laughs about, it might be great. But if you send that same message to an audience that is 30 years older and maybe a little bit more conservative, um, not only would they not know what you're talking about, but they might take it the wrong way or maybe even get offended or think that you're unprofessional. So you have to be careful with that. Awesome. And then last one, does putting the company name and then the subject create a better open rate? Uh, so to that person I would ask, do you mean the company name of the sender or the recipient? I would think that it would be their company name and then the subject of what they're calling for. So I would not really recommend putting in the name of like like if I'm sales folk and I'm and I'm sending an email to someone else, um, I wouldn't put my name, my company name, sales folk in the subject line because it's self. Yeah, they just clarified the recipient okay. company name. Oh, the recipient. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, so um, you can if it's fitting. Um, I think. You can't just rely on that. You can't just like have their their name and something really basic, especially because there are more and more tools out there to personalize emails now than ever before. So other people are doing it. Um, there was a time where adding first name or company name like in the subject line almost always had a pretty big lift. I think um, 
more and more across a lot of industries, it's not making as big of a difference because more people are doing it. We might even reach a point, um, and it won't be that same point like universally, but different industries, different times, um, where having that will actually signal that it's like an, an annoying sales email. And so um, it really depends. Um, I, I say at the end of the day, test it. Um, if it's really fitting in the subject line, like it, it goes perfectly, you can definitely have it. But um, just shoving it in there to have it in there, um, I wouldn't do that. Awesome, Heather. I think we're okay to run to the okay, perfect. And then we've got a yeah. few more questions that we might be able to answer at the end. Okay, cool. Just have some more water. Okay. So um, I think we have like five or six emails submitted, and uh, so really quickly, um, I'm going to read through this, uh, but before I critique it, I would love to hear um, from the audience what you think is wrong and right with this template, and then I can go over my feedback in a minute. Um, Rufalin, can we, we can see what they write, right? Yeah, so already within the questions box, we've seen a comment here. It's far too long. Yeah, that's definitely one of them. Um, here, actually, I'm, I'm going to be lazy. I'm not going to read it out loud. I'm going to let all of you read it. Uh, let me know if you guys can't see it, um, just to save my voice. <laughs> but um, here, I'll reread it really quickly, and then anyone else, uh, if you want to say what you think is wrong with it, please do, and then I'll go over my feedback. So we've got too much I and we need to focus on them, and there are no benefits. Yep, exactly. Um, you definitely have that. I think there's also, well, go on, and then I will, I'll, I'll say even more in a second. Uh, five more seconds. Anyone else want to throw in their answer? It's impersonal and the benefits are not specific. Uh, no unique selling proposition within the email. Yeah, those are all great. So I'm going to reveal. Oh, sorry. You can say it. <laughs> not a single focus as well is another. Yeah. Those are all. Those are all definitely correct. Um, like, like said already, uh, it's too much about the sender, and it's it's really not that compelling in the intro and and overall. Um, the intro could be a lot stronger if it was leading with like a benefit or some specific uh, focus. Overall, the email is trying to say and do too many things. Um, there's also not really um, very strong social proof. Uh, apparently, there's like an example or two where they would mention client name, but um, it's basically like I've been mandated to seek out valuable accounts such as client. That's not really showing how um, they're benefiting the client. It's saying preferred pricing and preferential callout response, which. I don't know, maybe that's a really common industry term or a strong benefit, but it sounds more like jargon and features, um, at first glance at least. Um, it's also kind of weird how there's sort of a call to action in the middle that says, please feel free to contact me, even though it's a very weak one. And then sort of something at the beginning, the flow of it is kind of odd. Also, there's, there's too much going on in here. Um, as far as features go, there's not a lot of benefits and there's not much focus. Um, I'm assuming that this email is the first touch and they haven't had a call with a person yet. Um, if that was the case, it'd be a little bit different, but I'd still say a lot of this stuff holds. Uh, let's look at the next template. So take a minute to read this and let me know what you think is wrong with it. Um, and then I can give feedback, but I'd love to hear from you first. And by the way, I would give feedback on the subject lines, but I don't think anyone uh, that I can remember included them. So,
So one of the things I'm not sure about with this one is if it actually ends with dot 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 or if there is more personalized, but um, they didn't add it because it varied a lot. If, if there was more in there that was relevant, it might be better, but if it actually ends like that, it's a little bit odd. Um, I'd like to assume that there's more in there, but who knows. Um, so anybody, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on this email? Uh, we've got, hey, as an intro is too impolite and too impersonal. I think hey can be okay, but it kind of depends on the audience. If you're reaching out to like software companies in California, I think it would be fine. Um, but definitely if you're reaching out to people in like the banking industry or like, you know, some kind of like heavy manufacturing and the people are probably all over like age 40 or 50, then yeah, I probably wouldn't use hey, but I think if you're dealing with a younger audience, it's it's okay, but kind of depends. It's a good point. Um, but other feedback. The writer is asking for information before providing any value. They should lead with the benefit. Yes. No, that's a great point. Um, others? The difference in font colors. Yeah, and I don't know if that was just because of the way it got in my email chain, but yeah, it, if it's the case, it definitely should be the same color. And, and is that it, or were there more? We've got typos and poor wording to be an issue within the email. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well these are some great ones. Um, so some of my feedback, um, the intro is definitely kind of boring and self-focused. Um, it's not really clear what's in it for the buyer from the start, just as was said. Um, there's just a lot of jargon in here overall, and it, it feels a little bit stiff. Um, I'm not really quite sure what kind of uh, prospective customer they're reaching out to, so it's hard to say what they should be saying instead without that information. But um, there really isn't a lot in the way of like benefits or a real incentive to keep reading or respond. Um, the email overall kind of flows in a weird way um, with these questions and then explaining who the company is after the fact. Um, and also the social proof in that, that blue paragraph, um, it really doesn't feel like social proof as much as bragging. So they're not really talking about a specific customer, a specific benefit they have. The only thing in there I really see is uh, where it says help companies manage risk within their portfolio and enable trade. But um, that on its own is pretty limited. Um, the rest is just talking about how many offices they have and how much revenue they have and their ratings and like, I guess maybe that's that's okay for the industry, but it just seems a lot more like look at me versus look at how I can help you. And then um, obviously the like, call to action isn't even really there. So um, you want to always be thinking about, okay, what do you want them to do? What do you want them to do next? And this is missing that. So let's look at email three. Uh, take a minute to read this and then we'll get into it. And by the way, with this one, I'm, I'm not quite sure if, um, it depends on the context of this email because the first sentence leads me that, to think that possibly um, the sender was given information um, through the partner like, like they requested information through the partner. If that's the case, it would be a little bit different in terms of how familiar you are, but if the partner just gave them a list of some of their clients um, and, and no intro was given or no information prior to the sender giving the uh, sender sending out this email, then it's a little bit different because um, the person receiving the email wouldn't be as aware of the person sending the email. So I know it's kind of jargony and confusing, but basically, 
If someone has expressed um, interest in something that you're selling or your company, um, and they sort of know an email is coming from you or some kind of uh, communication, then you can kind of get away with a little bit more as far as um, how forward you are and how self-focused you are or not. Um, obviously, you should always think about your audience, but um, you can you can be a little bit more, um, I want to say aggressive, but um, aggressive is not really the word, direct. Uh, if they've asked you to contact them directly or indirectly through someone else, um, but if that hasn't happened, you need to be a little bit more considerate and um, less eager. But anyways, uh, does anyone have feedback on this one before I, I quickly critique it? We thought that there's nothing specific about how they can help with efficient and profitable operations. Yeah. Um, there's no benefit within the email. Um, there's too much information provided beforehand. Mm -hmm. And no call to action. Yeah, those are all great and all uh, very correct. So I'd agree with all those. I'd just add to that that um, also with that link, you don't know they're even going to click on that link at all, and you haven't really given them a strong reason to click on either of those links. So if, if the benefit of what you do is in those links and they don't click on it, then they're not going to respond to your email. Um, so yeah, I'd agree with all that and more. Let's just go to the next one for time's sake. Um, so take a minute to really quickly read that one, and then um, uh, we can go from there. By the way, the subject line was like their company name and the recipient's name. Okay, so what is our feedback? Just waiting on oh, no, feedback. Okay. Yeah. I got a little eager. <laughs> Yeah, and I think we only have like one or two more templates and then we can do questions with the remaining uh, time we have. We've got here, they should name the mutual friends that they have. Yes. Um, providing a name. Because otherwise it seems fake and sketchy. It's a positive start in mentioning the referral, but you should tell them what you do and yes. what type of value you add. Yeah, because in here, actually, when it says I represent blah, 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 that whole giant line was actually the company name and the name of, like, a service or product line that they had. It was super long, you can see. It's, like, almost two whole lines. And that was just, like the name of something. And I don't know, maybe that was common in the industry and it meant something, but seemed a lot more like this is the name of the company I work for and the product we're selling than any kind of benefit. Any others? One of the comments here, why would you quote uh, when you don't necessarily know that they want this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It almost sounds like that someone requested through a friend a quote, but I really doubt that's the case because they're not stating the name or the thing that was requested. So it does seem really eager. Um, let's just reveal it. So pretty much what we said, and then there, there could just be a lot more social proof and context around what they're selling. It could be a lot less forward with just like talking about a quote that's very specific, that's kind of odd. <laughs> I mean, 26 grams and heavier, 29 grams must go through our lumber yard partners. Like, I don't know, maybe some of that is more relatable to someone in the industry in a way I don't know, but it sounds kind of weird just reading it, not knowing anything, and there's obviously no call to action. Um, let me just see how many, oops, yeah, we have uh, we have two more. Oof. Actually, I'm just going to skip ahead for time's sake. So we have this email here that um, uh, says good afternoon. And um, 
as you can see, the intro itself is pretty boring. Um, I mean, it's maybe a little more acceptable if they requested information, but it could really be so much more compelling. It's kind of wasting an opportunity to get them excited about whatever you're trying to sell um, and whatever your value is, so that could be different. Um, also, the email itself kind of feels unfocused because it's sort of all over the place. Um, the, the flow doesn't really feel smooth. If this was after a sales call and there was specific information requested, it might make a little bit more sense with all the things that are listing. Uh, but I'm guessing it's not. I'm guessing that maybe there's like an inbound lead and then they haven't had a sales call yet. In which case, it might not even make sense to send that, that link yet uh, because that might be overwhelming. That might be better to go over on a call or after a call. Um, I don't know. Maybe there, there's something in the form requested about the gasket size and this is what they're responding to. But unless there are specific qu uh, questions asked in a previous email from the customer, the email itself feels kind of like choppy without a flow. And then also there's really not a call to action. Um, let's do this one though. Let's do email six together really quickly. Uh, so in the next 30 seconds to a minute, give your feedback after you read this, and then we'll take whatever questions you have. And Rupalin, you can read the feedback as soon as it comes. There's so much construction outside. There's the Transbay Terminal and the Salesforce Tower being built just right around the corner. Okay, do we have any feedback? If not, I'm just going to skip forward and read it. Um, if we do, uh, let's yeah, hear it. Okay, okay, cool. Cool. We've got here, I think it's short and to the point as they probably covered a lot of things during um, a previous conversation, but the intro is pretty wordy. Um, there's a weak call to action. It's not very personal um, and very transactional. Mm -hmm. um, there's no benefit and they're asking too much of the recipient, but it is nice and concise um, yeah. with a personal thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, I think I, I agree with all those things. So, um, I mean, it's hard to say what was said on the call or not. Um, the intro is okay. It's kind of wordy, but I think it could be a little bit more enticing. You could mention something about the benefit in it rather than just saying it. Um, also, I don't know if it really makes sense to just say you can visit a website here there isn't like, you know, you can see blah, 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 something specific on the website. Um, although the portfolio page is mentioned, so I don't know if we even need to mention the website link because that's probably in your signature. Um, I think it could just be a little bit more compelling uh, and the call to action. They kind of have like a polite ending, but it's not really um, clear what the next step is. So. I agree with all of that. Um, we have like a minute left. Uh, do we have any questions? And by the way, um, you can check out our email mastery course if you want more tips on cold email. I created a special 
link for you. It's bit.ly slash email Canada. And um, also, uh, actually, we're about out of time. If you have more questions, you can email me at heather at salesfolk.com or tweet at me at Heather Rehan, R-E-Y-H-A-N. Um, but sorry, I'm gonna actually have to take another call after this, but um, uh, hopefully you found this helpful, and I'll hand it back to Rubalyn. Yes, thank you so much, Heather. We've, we've, we've received a few questions here, but I'm okay to email those to you. Perfect. Afterwards, I want to thank our host, of course, Heather. Thank you so much for running such a great webinar. And of course, our audience, thank you so much for joining us on Mastering the Art of the Sales Email. Wishing everybody a great day. Thank you again, and we hope you stay tuned for our next webinar. Thank you. Happy Cool Million. Cheers.